morning friends i welcome you all to the fifth day of philoma 2020 today's lecture on teaching a second language in post metaphysical approach by <laughs> professor b mansu ask me professor of english studies university of gulian iran he is a renowned scholar has 27 years of teaching experience guiding research scholars and produced many doctorates specially well versed in post metaphysical literature has published many articles and papers in a reputed journals he has recently published a book in persian explaining the recent epistemological issues and their consequences for especially the humanities professor the floor is yours thank you very much uh, first of all welcome professor. i would like to do you hear me yes okay. yes yes I would... professor professor i would like to thank everyone especially the respected office uh, as you mentioned uh, the title is teaching a second language uh, it doesn't matter what language it is and first of all i should explain that i differentiate between teaching a second language and uh, the language that someone learns uh, at home or languages someone learns at home this is the time when someone has already learned uh, the first language uh, then we have the general working hypothesis or i may say that this is the general background or the methodology that i try to apply here uh, i should explain that uh, the 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 basis of humanities uh, changed in the mid 20th century and this change had its impact upon different uh, fields in the humanities first of all i refer to uh, one of the pioneers who explained this change his name is hans jörg gadamer gadamer is one of the students of martin heidegger in fact heidegger uh, was the person who discovered that language uh, has been misunderstood and this misunderstanding uh, had its impact on different fields especially in the humanities of course it was uh, different for other fields for example for theoretical physics but the main impact was on the humanities uh, in other fields for example in uh historiology or in psychology and psychoanalysis uh there were people who talked about this change people uh like for example in psych psychoanalysis people like jacques lacan or um a lot of people um for example frankfurt school who started talking about historiology upon the basis of this new uh, epistemology uh gadamer explains here that what was the problem with the humanities in general he says the logical self reflection that accompanied the development of the human sciences in the 19th century is wholly governed uh, by the model of natural sciences this means that people Uh, started developing sciences especially in the humanities upon the epistemological basis that they had for natural sciences this caused a very significant problem for the humanities and uh, uh, he was the one or one of the one of the people who suggested that uh we in the humanities better to change this uh, basis after that uh 
there were other scientists and thinkers like this one, Jürgen Habermas, who explained the change, who explained the basic or the epistemological change. He said that the shift in paradigms from philosophy of consciousness to philosophy of language. This is, this is uh, significant because when he is talking about philosophy, of philosophy, he means epistemology. And we know that epistemology is the basis of almost all sciences. The basic tenets of epistemology uh, have its own impact upon the way that we think about any topic. So here the change, the main change in almost all fields of the humanities is from philosophy of uh, consciousness to philosophy of language. So people started uh, rethinking about the problems of the humanities uh, upon the basis of philosophy of language. Uh, later, perhaps another student of uh, Martin Heidegger, Jacques Derrida, in a historical speech, perhaps in, at Yale University, uh, he uh, formulated the change and uh, he contributed to the uh, epistemological understanding. Uh, he says, this was the moment when language invaded universal problematic. The moment when in absence of origin, everything became discourse. Here, uh, there is a, uh, we know that he was, it was a critique of a structuralism, but the main point that he mentions here is about the basis of knowledge. The basis of knowledge, according to him, is discourse. So everything is based upon discourse. Uh, I will. I am going to explain it further. Okay. Uh, here we have basics and definitions. In order to make my argument clear, uh, I would like to talk about a few terms. They are. Uh, my, uh, say, uh, method or methodology of approaching the uh, question. First of all, I use the term metaphysics. Uh, and metaphysics, uh, in, in, according to my definition, is, in, or in metaphysics, language is a tool. Uh, this means that people talk about language and they reduce language only to communication. In other words, they identify language with a speech. However, they are different. Uh, the most basic tenet of understanding, uh, of course, before the mid 20th century, was called metaphysics or philosophical metaphysics. In philosophical metaphysics, Language is a tool that represents things already existing by themselves. This means that something, for example, a book, the book is there, the desk is there, and I use the word book or desk in order to represent that thing, that thing which already is there. And here, there is no need for uh, or there is, uh, or this uh, tenet uh, doesn't need any dependence on language. In other words, words or signifiers are signs of things in themselves, which are supposed to have an identity or a being of themselves or a being of their own. Uh, this is important, I repeat myself. Uh, people usually think this is a, a, a common, common sense understanding, not a scientific understanding, that things are there without their own understanding. And their understanding uh, is, is totally based on 
the language that they have in their minds. I will. I shall explain further. Uh, another person, Jacques Derrida, also explains uh, about uh, metaphysics. He says that uh, he explains the problem of understanding visual perception as knowledge. He says the whole history, the whole semantics of uh, the European idea in its Greek genealogy, as we know, as we see, relates seeing to knowing. This means that uh, this, there is this presupposition, normally, that people think what they see is what they understand. However, the truth is different. What we see is something, and what we understand is totally different. Uh, I, will, I will explain it uh, further. Uh, another term is pre-linguistic age. First of all, I shall uh, explain that by language, I do not refer to speech. Uh, if I ask you, if I ask you the respected audience, to remember a poem that uh, you have already memorized just in your ma mind without vocalizing that, then uh, you can see the words in your mind. They are, that is language in your mind. So what, what you say is, is your speech, and what you write is your uh, writing. But language is in your mind. Of course, mind is also a creation of language. But however, I, I use it in order to make myself clear. Uh, another uh, term was prelinguistic age. You, you have seen children start uh, speaking. They, they produce words, they vocalize words. However, that is not language. Language is shaped or is produced in the mind of the child when the child starts connecting the words in his or her mind. So there is no uh, language when the words are not connected to each other in the mind. That connection means understanding. So the prelinguistic age is the time when the child starts uh, uh, vocalizing some, some sounds, uh, but they are not words. Later, when he connects them together, then it becomes language. Then, uh, what I mean by language, what is the meaning of language? Uh, the first person who realized uh, what language really is, is Martin Heidegger. However, he was difficult to understand until uh, Jacques Derrida started using uh, Ferdinand Saussure's terminology, and that terminology helped us to understand Heidegger uh, much better. Uh, language, according to this post-metaphysical understanding, is a net of non-phenomenal signifiers. Uh, signifier is, is the suggestion of uh, Sosor. Sosor said that instead of using uh, the word or sign, we better use the word signifier because it, it makes things easy for us. He said that language is a net of non-phenomenal. Phenomenal means material. Uh, phenomenal is uh, uh, against what we call noumenal. Noumenal is related to the mind, related to the psyche. So language is not material. Of course, I'm not talking about speech or writing. Speech and writing are phenomenal, but language is not. So language is a net of non-phenomenal signifier. Hence, it is noumenal. It is what we have in our minds. 
words in one's mind that make discourses to make reality uh, through senses. I should explain that everyone makes his or her own reality. How by the words or by the signifiers that he or she has in the mind and uh, the projection of those words, those signifiers to the surroundings makes the reality. Uh, here I would like to quote Soso because um, this is uh, important for our discussion. Soso, this is exactly his uh, quotation, of course, from the book uh, General Link, Course in General Linguistics. He says, language is form and not a substance. This is important. You should pay attention to this word, substance. Uh, this means that language is not material. When we say that language is not material, so we cannot identify speech and writing with language. Speech and writing are material and we can measure them, but we cannot measure signifiers because we cannot have sense control over them. The senses, the five senses, have nothing to do with the language directly. He says that language is form, not a substance. And he adds that for all our mistakes of terminology, all our incorrect ways of designating things belonging to language originate in our unwittingly supposing uh, that we are dealing with a substance when we deal with linguistic phenomena. Uh, linguistic phenomena language is a unique um, or has a unique existence, is a unique being, and therefore we cannot say that language is like this or that. Um, I remember this uh, quotation from Martin Heidegger. He says that language is language and we cannot compare it to anything else. Uh, if I'm going to add uh, to this, uh, I, I shall have uh, another quotation by Sosor. He says that word or signifier is psychological imprint, of course, by psychological, he means psychic, related to psychic. So it is by no means material. The sound pattern is not actually a sound, for a sound is something physical. Uh, so here uh, I differentiated language and the text, language and speech and writing. They are two different things. Uh, this way of understanding language makes a philosophical uh, problem, a very old philosophical problem, clear. Because when we use the terminology of Soso, we can understand what meaning is. To have meaning is signification. That is uh, Sosor's suggestion. Instead of using the word uh, meaning or instead of using the word uh, sign or word, we use signifier. And therefore, meaning becomes signification. How? Signifier refers to signifies. A word refers to their meanings. A signifier refers to signifies that are in fact other signifiers. What are signifies? They are other signifiers. And what are those signifiers? Uh, they are signifiers who refer to other signifiers. And they make uh, a net of signifiers creating different discourses. So I conclude here, here uh, we have uh, perhaps uh, something like formula 
to have meaning is signification. What is signification? Is the play or reference of signifiers to each other. Uh, signification equals signifiers referring to other signifiers in different discourses. Um, ad infinitum means uh, there is no end for that. Uh, there is no beginning and there is no end for that. So when we uh, say that language is a net of signifiers, then we are actually talking about uh, connection of these uh, signifiers to each other. When uh, we have this net in our mind, we have discourse. What is discourse? Discourse is, this is the definition by Foucault, but um, it doesn't make uh, any difference. There were other people who uh, explained discourse, and all of them based on the same epistemological assumption. Foucault says discourse is the group of statements that belong to a single system of formation. For example, clinical discourse, economical discourse, uh, the discourse of natural history, psychiatric discourse, and um, I would like that everyday discourse, the, the way that we talk to each other is also a type of discourse and it has its own uh, presuppositions, no matter we know about them or we don't. And here, uh, uh, I may add that whether we take, uh, this is again by Soso, uh, whether we take the signification or the signal, the language includes neither ideas nor sounds existing prior to linguistic system, but only conceptual and phonetic differences arising out of that system. Um, I may explain this. People normally think that they have a thought, they have an idea separate from language, and then they use language in, in order to express that idea, express that intention. That is not true. Uh, in fact, what they say is, is uh, the uh, usage of the language or parts of language signifiers that they have in their minds. So what they have in their minds, their intention, their ideas is uh, made up of all signifiers, all words. Here uh, I formulate um, language, I formulate discourse, every discourse is composed of uh, this formula here, S uh, equals bracket S1, S2, S3, and etc. cetera, uh, bracket closed. Here, S stands for signifier, and brackets indicate presence of any discourse, which also acts as background language or background knowledge. You know, when we talk, when we think, uh, there are a lot of discourses functional, uh, but we are not fully aware of them. Uh, again, I repeat this uh, differentiation because it is important. So we have language, which is not material, which is not phenomenal and is noumenal related to the psyche. And uh, we have text. Text can be either verbal or written. Uh, also, things that we see around us, uh, they are also texts and uh, we read them. So here I repeat again, language is what we have in our minds. We cannot have sensual connection with that. We cannot see it, we cannot touch it cannot smell it and so forth. 
and that is uh, noumenal, but that can be spatialized. We can dedicate some space to that. And spatialized language is text, which can take the form of verbal or uh, written text, and also other things. Uh, here, uh, some people ask about the reference. For example, when I say book, I refer to that thing. This is, again, uh, sometimes oversimplified. Common sense that, okay, the book is there, and uh, I uh, use the word in order to represent that thing. However, this is not true. Uh, in fact, the reference belongs to the world of the senses to the phenomenal world. And language is something uh, related to our psyche in our mind. They are two different and separate things. Uh, so when we talk about an object, our talking, our thoughts about that object is different from the object which is there. We may add that no one thinks uh, with, with that object. We think about the object through our senses, through the filter of our senses, by our own language. So uh, here we are dealing with two different worlds. When our world is correct, then we say that we have truth about that um, object that we are studying and uh, sometimes we cannot get to the truth about that object and that's where we may make a mistake. And that was a question of reference. Reference is another realm. Five senses and their objects or the phenomenal and the, ph the phenomenal in fact, objects are identified and given identity by language. So an object becomes that object uh, because of language. In fact, there is no difference between the things there. Um, I may refer to animals. No animal can see the difference between this book and that book, between this object and that object. They can see that, but they don't know this one is a book, that one is a notebook, and that one is a laptop. They cannot, dif they are all objects for them. They can see them perhaps better than human beings, but they cannot understand what they are. Understanding is related to the language, the signifiers in our minds. Okay. Uh, here uh, we have this title, Linguistic Construction, uh, Net of Signifiers. Um, if the construction of the first language in the mind is thus reconsidered, that is to say, if we think about language, as I just explained, as something noumenal, not phenomenal, uh, then uh, we can see that language is like a net of signifiers. So I can say that any discourse is like a net of signifiers. We have the discourse in our mind, and then uh, we put the object in that discourse and we identify it. This net of signifiers uh, normally or scientifically explained upon two axes. Um, as I explained, uh, the syntagmatic axis, uh, which, is, which means horizontal or linear axis of signifiers. Mm. If I want to uh, apply an example, a normal sentence that uh, we usually use, for example, I say, he is a student. The relationship of the signifiers in the sentence 
he is a student is a linear uh, relationship, is a, uh, as I said, syntagmatic axis. It is linear, it is horizontal. However, I can change this sentence and say that he is a teacher, and that is paradigmatic axis. And these two axes make the net of language. Paradigmatic axis is the vertical axis or lexical variations that we may have in, uh, in discourses. So I repeat again, uh, discourses in our minds is like a net. And this net, the relationship of these nodes, the relationship of these signifiers to each other uh, may have two shapes, two ways. One is syntagmatic axis or horizontal and linear. The other one is paradigmatic axis, the vertical or lexical variations. Uh, here I shall explain the issue further. It is about language, reference, and uh, reality. Um, upon this linguistic net, uh, the objects of the senses that we call reference are placed. Um, I explain it, uh, I repeat my explanation again. Um, when there is this object in front of me, for example, this book that I'm looking at, just looking at it doesn't make it a book. When I make the word book present in my mind, then I identify the object as the book. I already have the meaning or the signified of the word, of the word book of the word book uh, in my mind. And therefore, that thing becomes a book by the usage, by the presence of the word signifier book in my mind, of which I know the meaning. Uh, upon the, this linguistic net, uh, the objects of the senses, references are placed and given identity. Hence, objects become things with names and identity. This is how reality is made by one person. So that is how we can explain uh, why people explain about a single phenomenon by different uh, approaches, different words. Uh, without the net of language, Nothing is distinguishable from another thing. So that becomes a mass of matter and energy. Uh, if there is no language, there is no world, there is nothing. Then it becomes like being uh, like animals that have no world and live in their surroundings by the forces of stimuli and their instinctive responses. Um, I explained that just seeing something doesn't bring any understanding. Understanding comes when we start using the words in our mind, when you start uh, making the word present in our mind. When the word is present, the signifies are also present, whether we uh, focus on them or not, no matter. But understanding is totally related to the language, to the words that someone uh, knows. And now I go to uh, a learning of the second language. Of course, uh, I better say that by second language, I mean the language that someone learns uh, when he or she has already learned the first language. There are people uh, who are brought up uh, in circumstances 
in which um, different language is used. That is somehow different. But uh, this second language, or some people say foreign language, is the time when the person has already learned uh, the first language. That is to say, he has already uh, made the reality in his mind. When a second language learning begins, this net of first language is already woven, is already there, and referring uh, of signifiers to each other is active all the time to make reality uh, by or in that language. So uh, here, uh, someone knows, for example, his, his uh, first language, he already has made the reality for himself or herself, and he or she wants to learn a new language. Here, uh, we have a problem. What is the problem? Uh, I, I shall explain it here. The first signifiers or words uh, of the second language aren't uh, in the linguistic net of the learner. That is to say, the learner has already knows the language. And when you, uh, when a teacher tries to uh, teach him a new, a new language, a new word in that language, that is not a word. That is just a sound that that person hears. And what does he do? I shall explain it here. Or what happens in his mind? Uh, therefore. Uh, they are meaningless sounds and not fires, as they don't belong uh, to the net of first language. So they are only sounds, they are not. Or the learner is forced to juxtapose the first sounds by the words or the signifiers of the first language. That is to say, uh, someone knows uh, his language and he wants to learn a foreign language. When he hears the first sound, he connects it to his first language. So uh, the target language, the word of the target language is connected to the signifiers of the first language. So becomes uh, somehow complicated in the mind of the learner. That is to say here, uh, that is to say, uh, the, the second language signifier is understood with the first language signifies. This becomes problematic when the fact of Differences of meaning of words in different languages is brought into focus. Um, we know that if in one language one word has several meanings, several signified, we, we know that it is not necessarily the same in the target language. The, uh, the word or the signifier in the target language uh, has different meanings. So the learner, the first thing that he does, he, he tries to identify, he tries to understand the word, that new word, that new sound, by the use of the first language. So it is not a, a word for him. It is just a foreign sound, which is understood by the signifiers of the first language. Uh, here, uh, this becomes problematic when the fact of differences of meaning of words in different languages is brought into focus. This process is continued until one only only some students may succeed to make this linguistic net possibly make another type of reality. That is to say, 
only just few or a few students uh, learn the language. By language, I mean discourses that net of some people uh, may live in foreign countries and they may use some words of that foreign language, but they never learn that language. Why? Because they, they cannot succeed to make that discourse. They cannot succeed to make that net of signifiers in their minds. And they keep on thinking with their first language. This process here, this process is continued until only some students may succeed to make the second linguistic net to possibly make another type of reality. This is important. Uh, well, speaking in a language, just to go in a shop and uh, want to buy something and say just a few words, that is not language. But if he wants to uh, make the reality by, by the use of uh, the words, uh, if he wants to learn a discourse, he must have or he must make that net of language, net of signifiers in his mind. Um, and that net, that second net, means that he has succeeded to remake the reality in another language. If uh, you are interested in uh, knowing about uh, this uh, relationship between reality and languages, I uh, refer you to uh, two of Wolf's articles. Uh, Benjamin Lee Wolf's articles. Mm, as far as I know, he is the only linguist in English-speaking world uh, who uh, understood language in this in this uh, new scientific manner. Here's the, two of his articles are really wonderful. When I was reading that, I was uh, really surprised that someone with, with the knowledge of that time could understand the truth about language. Benjamin Lee Wolf. Okay. And then we go to uh, actual function of the four skills according to the way that I explain language. I said that uh, language is net of signifiers. And this net is uh, or has uh, or works upon two axes, uh, syntagmatic axis and paradigmatic axis. Uh, when we start teaching these skills, let me first read this. Um, as for teaching our four main skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, if the, if the teacher knows that the skills in fact do the same thing in the learner's mind, she or he might be more successful in the act of teaching. These four skills, which belong to the phenomenal world, to the material world, as I just explained, to the phenomenal world of communication, perform a single act in the learner's mind. They are supposed to construct a second net, a second net of signifiers in which the words refer to each other all the time, almost without the interference of the first language. This is the ideal goal, uh, which only occur rarely. Uh, in fact, uh, most learners succeed to make this second net by hard work only if their aptitude or uh, their intelligence uh, suffices. Uh, I'd like to explain this uh, further. You know, when you teach listening, for example, you uh, put the person under the uh, listening of different sounds. What happens in the mind of that person? That person starts to make the sounds as the words, starts to 
uh, or tries to understand them uh, as words. He starts connecting them together. This means that the sig he starts to he tries to connect these signifiers together in order to uh, make that net, make that second net. This is the same for speaking. Of course, uh, in the phenomenal world, in the world of the matter, uh, they are different things. But what happens in the mind of the student is just one thing. Again, when he is uh, he's taught to, to pronounce the word, he refers to that net or to the part of the net that he has already made in his mind. This is the same for reading and also writing. In all of these uh, four types of skills, the person tries to connect these uh, signifiers to each other in order to make a second reality. That is what the teachers are uh, in fact doing. They're trying to make uh, that net and that net of signifiers the net of the second or foreign language in the mind of that uh, person. And the person, uh, whether he's aware of it or not, uh, is successful only when that net in the mind is complete or more or less complete or that net in the mind is shaped. If that net in the mind is shaped, that person may have a good uh, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. That is the point uh, where the teacher can make sure the person has or has already begun to learn the language. So that is the uh, perhaps uh, reality behind uh, teaching these apparently different types of skill. And uh, these skills, all of them, help the person to make that uh, net of signifiers in his or her mind. And uh, here I have some references. Um, of course, I explain that the first person who uh, introduced this type of thinking, of course, not in for teaching, not in uh, linguistics, uh, but in epistemology, philosophy of science, it was Martin Heidegger. He was difficult to understand until uh, one of his students, Jacques Derrida, started using uh, Saussure's uh, terminology, and Saussure's terminology made Heidegger's writings about language uh, easier to understand. I had mentioned Heidegger here, he, but he has many articles about language. Uh, I think that uh, if, um, if you study them, it is really helpful, not only for teaching, but also for understanding the changes that happened after the mid-20th century in different fields of the humanities. I have mentioned here uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, Derrida talked a lot about language in um, one of his books uh, named of Grammatology. You know, grammar, grammar in, uh, in Greek means letter, A, B, C. Uh, letter, grammatology means uh, the study of letters and he means uh, the study of writing. And there is, a, there is an article named Difference. That is also a difficult uh, article, but uh, I think it's helpful for understanding language. That is where he uses uh, Saussure's terminology in order to express uh, the, the understanding of language. Um, this book, Memoir of the Blind, in this book, he explains uh, how scientific views are made in Western countries uh, by categorizing the appearances. He says that everything 
almost everything in Western culture uh, was produced by uh, the arrangement or categorizing the appearances. That is what he says. And another uh, article by him, uh, this one, Structure, Sign, and Play in Discourses of the Human Sciences. This is important because this is the beginning of change in, uh, in the Western culture, especially in English-speaking world, uh, because uh, this is the beginning, according to some critics, the beginning of post-structuralism. Um, I explain something here. Uh, I use the term post-metaphysical. Post-metaphysics or metaphysics is a term that is normally used in epistemology, and it is uh, quite general. Uh, but in methodological studies, the term post-structuralism uh, is more current, is uh, used uh, further than post-metaphysics or metaphysics. Anyway, that, that article is uh, significant. And uh, another book that I refer to is Archaeology of Knowledge. This book by Foucault, uh, originally in French, uh, named Words and Things. Words and Things. He was also under the influence of this new understanding of language. And then we have Gadamer, Hans-Jörg Gadamer, this famous book, Truth and Method that I recommend reading that because he explains the, uh, the epistemological problems in a more or less uh, simple language. And then we have Habermas. Of course, Habermas is um, a philosopher of society, is a philosopher of history. But in this article, themes in post-metaphysical thinking, he talks about um, the epistemological change. Of course, it's, it's not a lot, but it is helpful. And uh, I, I'd like to introduce uh, another person, Theodore Adorno. He has a book named uh, Negative Dialectics. He also talks about uh, this uh, change in language uh, in such a way that he connects the change of understanding of language to uh, the understanding of history. So mm, this is this is a, a real, really new combination to talk about histor history in terms of uh, basic understanding of language. And uh, this book, finally, by Sosor, I'm sure you know about that, Course in General Linguistics, this book is uh, about, uh, as, as mentioned, about linguistics. There is nothing new in that book. Of course, uh, the present knowledge about phonology, about uh, syntax, diction, and so forth um, are uh, much more advanced. Uh, but the way that he talks about language itself, he talks about ontology of language, um, to which I referred, uh, is uh, very significant and important. Um, for the time being, that's, that's finished. But I may add that this is just the beginning. If you start thinking about language like this, I am sure that you will find a lot more. This is just uh, new. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. And thank for the respected office. If there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Professor. You are welcome. Uh, dear participants, is there any questions to be discussed with the Professor? Yeah, dear participants. Good afternoon, yeah. sir. Good afternoon, I have a question. Sir, you presented about language and uh, metaphysics. Can you throw some light on language and uh, metacognition? Metacognition? Yes. 
Well, uh, if I want to talk about cognition, uh, this is the question of uh, cognition, thought, and relationship to language. Cognition is composed of two sections. One section is related to our senses and our uh, brain. That is the world of the sense. That is what we share with uh, animals. However, cognition, human cognition, does not stop there. We have language. Uh, and, and animals uh, don't have language. Of course, language in the sense that we compose poetry, we read poetry, fiction, and like that. So cognition, according to this way of understanding, has two parts. One part is related to the senses and brain and our um, nervous system. The other one is related to uh, language, which is uh, an arbitrary system. Of course, the capability of uh, using language um, has been recently discussed by the term Kora or Chora, Kora. Uh, first of all, it was introduced by Plato. Plato did not talk about it a lot. But later in the 20th century, Derrida talked about Hora. And uh, after Derrida, uh, Julia Kristeva, he also talked about it. But it is still uh, a new topic and uh, it takes time to be uh, discussed further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, participant, is there any other questions to be discussed with the professor? Dear participants, any questions or something to be discussed? regarding the topic, teaching second language, a post-metaphysical approach to a professor. Would you like to share? No, sir. Oh, professor, it was indeed a great session that really we have been learning about. Yeah. <laughs> And how many? To end with the word of thanks. Sir, one question. Could you talk to your mom? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Sir, can, can you describe very briefly about uh, post metaphysical thinking, sir? Yes. Uh, post. First of all, metaphysics. Metaphysics is the is the way that people uh, started to think about different sciences in the humanities upon some epistemological basis, which explained that language is a tool of communication. That is to say, when language is reduced only to a tool of communication, we say that this is metaphysics. Post-metaphysics is the time, exactly the mid-20th century, when uh, thinkers and scientists in the humanities started to think about language not as just a tool of communication, but as, uh, as, as language. I, I explained that language is language. We cannot say that language is like this or that to explain further. Language, uh, when you are uh, thinking, when I say thinking, when you are connecting the words to each other in your mind, that is language. And when you start thinking upon that basis, everything changes. Your way of looking at things, your way of understanding uh, changes. The one example makes it clear. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you know about, uh, um, say, uh, psychology. Uh, Freud introduced psyche. Uh, the important thing about the introduction of psyche was the change that it produced for 
epistemology, the general epistemology. Why? Because epistemology at that time believed that if there is uh, an object that we would like to study, if we cannot have sense connection with that, if we cannot measure that, that subject is not or cannot be a scientific subject of a study. But when Freud introduced psyche, he introduced the topic, a subject matter, uh, to which we cannot have sense connection. That is to say, we cannot see it, we cannot touch it, we cannot measure it. So after that, uh, the, the, be the beginning of uh, metaphysical or post-metaphysical thinking um, started. That is to say, people started to accept that there are topics that cannot be measured, that cannot be seen, but they can be topics of the uh, scientific study, like psyche and later language. Perhaps I explain you, about... Uh, yeah, okay. please. Yeah, I explained about literature. Yes. Um, you know, uh, when you study a poem, uh, when you read the poem, uh, if you want to understand the poem, you start just using the words or signifiers in your mind. This means that the words in that poem do not refer to anything outside language. They just refer to each other. For example, there is this famous verse by Robert Burns. He says that my love is like a red, red rose. When I study this poem, I know nothing of uh, his beloved. I don't know who she was. And I also don't know about that rose. So what I do in my mind in order to appreciate that poem is to refer to my knowledge, my uh, signifiers that I already have from the words or from the signifiers, uh, love and red rose. That's it. So in this way, literature, literature is, a, is a use of language uh, which has no reference. Even if there are references to real people and real things, when we study literature, we should take it into consideration that they are mentioned there on the presupposition that they do not refer to anything but themselves. The words just refer to themselves. It is also called rhetoric. That was an example. Finished. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was You're wonderful welcome. explanation, sir. Thank you. For your detailed explanation on the topic, is there any questions, uh, dear participants? Uh, may I add something? Yes, yes, Professor. Um, about uh, this epistemological change, I have written a book in Persian. If you can read in Persian, the book is published by Gilan University. But uh, uh, on my site, on Academia site, academia.org, I have a page and I have written an article about this epistemological change in which I explain in some detail that what has happened. I also explain about language and the reference and uh, related issues about that. The, it is, uh, the, the, the article is named Epistemological Change in English Language. That is helpful on Academia site. Uh, if there are other questions, you can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I will be happy to be of any help if I can. Yeah, sure, Professor. We'll be sharing your LinkedIn link of your profile 
to the participants and they will Thanks. be in connection with you for any queries or the questions to be discussed on the board very very much dear participants uh, any more questions to be discussed with the professor um, sir yeah uh, i want to ask a question uh, thank you for your wonderful session uh, but the example uh, you gave from uh, a poem uh say so, uh one thing i want to ask uh when we read a poem when a reader uh, go through a poem uh he uh he just read uh, words or signifiers or he also connect his experience with those uh, words or those expressions uh in post meta uh, metaphysical uh, concept of language uh how can we understand this thing well what i explained in fact was in post metaphysical understanding um, the person who explained three person explained this issue you know before that before post metaphysics uh, it was believed that these these names in uh, literature in fiction in poetry they really refer to things but in post metaphysics three Uh, scientists three thinkers uh, started to explain literature one of them was again martin heidegger the other one was roman jakobsen and the third one was uh, paul domen these three thinkers uh, started to explain literature in post metaphysics that is to say they added that these words in this poem and that fiction they do not really refer to real people or real things they are just they just refer to each other and that is rhetoric and rhetorical understanding of literature is related to post metaphysics okay thank you sir you are welcome any more questions uh, dear participants can we proceed to the further agenda professor yes please um, for me i i just go ahead professor yes please yes yeah it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion i on behalf of IJRSW and Duro Academy of Research International and Educational Institution Department of English UGSF Nalamuthi Kondam Mahalingam College Pollachi and Wisdom Education Consultancy Pollachi I thank you for being part of here as a expert speaker of today and I would like to quote a quote of Nelson Mandela's if you talk to a man in a language he understands that goes to his head if you talk to him in his language that goes to his heart so as like that you just explained us briefly with murri and jeridas and shashuris and focus that how post metaphysical approach has to be on the second language teaching and i'm wholeheartedly thanking you professor for spending us time here with your valuable time and your experience you shared us and sure we will be reading out and i just circulating your article to our participants for their academic welfare and we will be in touch with you for the future thank you professor for spending here today with us thanks a lot i would also like to thank you again thank you very much nice to know you nice to see you all i hope everyone uh, remain healthy and fine Thank you very much. Goodbye now. Goodbye professor.